Okay, no, no countdown today <laughs> because we were a little late. It was my fault. I did uh, send the wrong link to the guys. So, um, hello everybody. Welcome to the show. Uh, uh, thank you, Arundo, for sharing uh, the stream. So today we have uh, two of the m most important promoters uh, uh, in the rock and scene, uh, Tom Ingram and uh, Andy Witter. So before we get to, to your questions, I would like uh, <laughs> to ask you some questions. Yeah. Um, Andy, how did it start for you? How did you discover uh, rock and roll, rockabilly? Um, basically, I was introduced into music by my parents because in the house where I was growing up with mom and dad, there was always music around, always. Country, Western, blues, rock and roll. Imagine that was when I was eight years, 10 years old, like 70s, I'm born 67. So uh, it was like 77, 78. And wherever we went in the car, there was always music at home. There was always music. And it was always the music we talk about today in this show. So this okay. was my first influence. And uh, my dad played in a uh, rock and roll band in the 50s. And later on, this is why I'm called Andy, because I'm named for Andy Tillman of the Tillman Brothers, who was a wow. close friend to my dad. <laughs> and um, well, I was too young, really, in that in that days. But uh, later on, I um, lost track. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, That's okay. <laughs> Tom, same, same question. How, how did it start for you? <laughs> well, I know I don't look it, but I'm actually quite a bit older than Andy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was born in 61, so I got into the music mainly through glam rock. I'd sort of watch the bands in England in the 70s, like Mud and Shawaddy Waddy and stuff like that, and I thought that was rock and roll. I thought they were teddy boys, and, and then gradually I sort of started realising they weren't, and... Then um, everyone in England, remember, there used to be a show in England called Cruising with Roger Scott, and they played it in our local on our local radio station near Portsmouth. And I started hearing all this different music. And, and I was probably 14 at the time, and I thought, wow, this music's really good. And I started to realise that Mud and Shawaddy Waddy weren't rock and roll. And <laughs> well, then I kind of rock and roll, just different. Huh? <laughs> then I heard some Elvis, and I saved up to buy an Elvis LP. And I was getting ready to go out and buy it, and one of our neighbours came around to see us, and she, I said, yeah, "I'm going to go and buy this Elvis LP." And she said, "Oh, well, I've got some old Elvis records. You can have if you want." And I said, "Really?" She goes, "Yeah." And I said, "Can I have them now?" <laughs> so we went and got them. And it was about 10 original Elvis LPs, which I still wow. have now. I've kept wow. them all this time. And there was Rock and Roll Volume 1, Rock and Roll Volume 2. There was um, Golden Records Volume 2. There was GI Blues, Something for Everybody. And like, and she just gave them to me, so I didn't need to go and buy the Elvis LP. And then it just went from Lucky there. You. <laughs> 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 so um was elvis uh, like your first favorite would, oh, would yeah. you say that yes yeah. definitely yeah and probably still is yeah, yeah. And, and for you andy did, did you have a uh, like when you listen to the music at, at your parents home did you have a favorite there or did you just enjoy um, everything or? no i was just um i'm a music addicted person so there always has to be a music around me and it has to be music i like but I don't have any borders to say, I do not like this, I blah, it, it just has to catch me. Um, the yeah. first two records I got from my aunt actually were Eddie Cochran and mm -hmm. Matchbox. And that was basically <laughs> for me, the, the really the, the impact to look for clues, to look for music I don't hear on the radio. Well, back then in Germany, in the radio, there was a lot of rock and roll, like Shaken Stevens rock and roll and Crazy Cabin. Um, mm. So this was my first impact to get really into re rock and roll records, not the records in the local record store, because yeah. in, the, in the small town I lived, there was only charts music in the record stores. <laughs> you know, I hear a lot of people 
over the years have put down, say, bands like, say, the Stray Cats or Shaking Stevens and some of the other bands that made it into the charts. But I've always said that, I mean, I, I was already into the music before they came along. Mm-hmm. But those bands got a lot of new people involved in the scene. And there's a certain age group now who will say, yeah, it was the Stray Cats that got me into Rockabilly. And yeah. whereas to me, they were already going when I, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I was already into the music when they started. Uh, yeah. mm-hmm. But for me, like I said, it was Shawadi Wadi and Mud and bands like that. So it's, everyone's got that something at their younger age that gets them into the music, which they might turn their backs on later and say, oh, well, yeah, that's not proper rock and roll or proper rockabilly. But yeah. you need to have that commercial music to get to have a scene. people into the scene. No one is going to get into Rockabilly with, with all the hip-hop that's on around at the moment yeah. because there's no connection. So you need to have some sort of commercial rock and roll and Rockabilly. You can obviously see that in Germany because Germany doesn't have the history of the music of the 50s, 60s and 70s like England has with the yeah. culture. In Germany, it was a, was a youth culture in the 80s. It was not yeah. a culture. And in these days, or since 20, 20 years, 10 years, we have grown up people who are rock and rollers by heart, but not a youth generation anymore. And in the 80s, with uh, magazines and stuff, we had like tens of thousands, I guess like 30, 40,000 kids yeah. into rockabilly, listening to Matchbox, Stray Cats, Shaken Stevens and Elvis, because it was in, in the magazines kids read yeah yeah i think yeah. in the 70s I, I, they I, I, mm. I think in the 70s <laughs> they reckon there was something like <laughs> two hundred and fifty thousand teds in england wow but yeah, you already had families big, like yeah. grandparents parents and children being rock and rollers yeah. and this was hardly to be found elsewhere yeah my family weren't yeah I, <laughs> I, I just want to uh, uh, tell the audience, um, you know, how it works. If you don't know yet, I mean, you can obviously uh, ask questions and we try to get uh, to as many as possible. And we highly encourage you to ask questions to uh, Andy and Tom. And um, if you want to make sure um, that we read out your questions, you can do uh, a super chat. Yeah? Any amount is fine or donate something uh, um, with paypal to let's talk at randyrich.de and just attach a question and uh, we'll definitely uh, prioritize those so if, and, if people um, make a donation are yeah. they likely to get their question answered <laughs> yes that's the plan yes. yeah. <laughs> that's the concept of <laughs> that's the concept yeah and also we have different categories today we have um as every uh, every time we have um, young and wild while we show uh, old pictures uh, <laughs> uh, from uh, and, uh, when Andy of and Tom people. were young <laughs> yeah exactly and also um, because Andy and Tom they um, they didn't want to play music uh, this time so no li no no live music but um, they're gonna present uh, to you their top three uh, you, rock and roll you songs have, you didn't and, give us uh, the opportunity to perform ourselves you didn't ask. Yeah. No, I, that was on purpose. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, but I will, uh, I will um, take the opportunity <laughs> to perform <laughs> one of your uh, top three songs. Yeah, not live because it's now uh, it's like uh, ten past ten in uh, Germany, yeah. and my neighbors wouldn't appreciate it. But no, I no uh, music after ten. I prepared something. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, I had one question on a uh, Patreon uh, where people. Um, can support me as well. Uh, Axel um, from Belgium, he asked uh, Tom Ingram, how did it start with the radio uh, channel, the Rockin' 24 seven? How did you come up with the idea? How did you start it? Well, I actually first started doing radio in London in 1984. And <clears throat> I got the opportunity to do a weekly show on a pirate radio station. Um, every Saturday at five o'clock and so i'd already done a lot of that was my start in radio and through that i got to do some stuff with some other stations in london so i was used to doing radio 
when I moved to the USA, I was still recording some shows and sending them back. But in those days, to send a show to England, I had to record it onto a cassette and mail the cassette, which wasn't really ideal. <laughs> and so eventually that stopped. And though I sort of tried to get a radio show somewhere, it wasn't that easy. And then I got the opportunity to be involved in another radio station that we all know. And that didn't go as, I was there for a couple of years, but it wasn't going as I wanted or felt it should be. And so that's when we came up with the idea of doing Rockin' 24-7 radio. Mm -hmm. And we wanted, if you limit your music by the name of the radio station, you're sort of stuck within that narrow band of music. And the rocking scene has got so much more music than rockabilly that we want to yeah. be able to encompass it and not be against what the name of the station was. So by calling it Rockin' 24-7 Radio, we can play any music that we consider rocking. And yeah. so that's how we came up with the name and the idea of it. We were more into getting people who are known on the scene as opposed to getting people who are great DJs on the radio. Because yeah. for it to have the credibility that it needs, you have to have people who the, the average listener recognises. And then it makes that connection between the clubs and the radio station to make it a truly scene-based radio station. How many how many DJs do you have now? Uh, do you know? I don't know. It's somewhere between, <laughs> somewhere between 45 and 50, something like that. Yeah. Well, well. Yeah. It's, which is a lot. It is a lot, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, Andy, uh, do you remember when, uh, probably not, when, when I met you the first time? What? <laughs> uh, possibly on a Ike and the Capers show in the east part of Germany before the wall came down, or on tour with one of the 50s guys up northeast where you live, in Rostock, Rostock or Kühlungsborn, not Kühlungsborn, but Rostock, probably. <laughs> well, at first, um, before the wall came down, Ike and the Capers were not around. <laughs> they started, <laughs> they started, um, they started okay, the previous they, band. Sorry, yeah, Ike. Not even, not even them. No, <laughs> they were. Okay. Uh, Ike, Ike was like 14 then. Or the, yeah. <laughs> But um, I think I met you in Munich at, at one of the festivals. Um, could that be that you, that you sold uh, records? Could be well selling yeah. records. I started selling records like eighty six or seven, and I started yeah. selling records professionally in nineteen ninety. So most likely the answer is yes. I think like it I was, was selling like. like... Go ahead. I think it was ninety ninety two because that was my first Munich uh, festival, and okay. and obviously before the wall came down, I I, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't go to Munich or any other festival and. I didn't even know that there there are like modern burn, uh, bands around, and I didn't know that some of the old guys are still performing. You know, so I. I, I remember having been in, in the east 90. part of Berlin and in the east before the wall came down, and attending some mm. music things. It was different, yeah. of course, but <laughs> um, anyway, five years, ten years, twenty five yeah. years. <laughs> but... No, I didn't. Oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't really recognize. Obviously, I don't really know. Yeah, uh, Udo just answered here. I can the caper start um, in 1994, 1995. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it was probably. Yeah, could be, could be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's around the time when I met Tom the first time, though. In '94, I went to to Hemsby, and that, for me, I mean, that was. <laughs> That was just, <laughs> I can't even describe it. Uh, uh, and I think many people who, who are now on, on, um, watching the live stream, they, they feel exactly the same. I mean, that was just uh, something else and yeah. for us, you know. And um, when did you start at Hamsby again? And, um, 1988, I think it was. 88 hmm. or 89. Wow, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's this crazy idea and... There was a whole story behind it as well. And because I'd been going to some of the other weekenders and 
I felt that the promoter who was doing Weekenders then wasn't doing a good job. He had security that would go around with baseball bats and pickaxe handles. And if anyone was making any <laughs> music kind of stop security at midnight, it would yeah. make people go to their own chalets. And, and there was one I went to where I actually walked up to the promoter and said, there's your check back. I don't want anything to do with this weekend. I don't agree with the way you treat the customers. Yeah. And I said, that's it, I'm done. And he turned around to me and he said, well, I, if you want to do your own weekend, then go ahead. So I said, okay. So I actually got one organized like quite quickly. And he heard about it and persuaded the campsite to cancel it because it was connected to the same company that he was doing weekenders for. Right? And so he got it stopped. Okay. And so I... I phoned. I thought, right, I'm going to phone around, and I actually phoned up Pontins at Canberra Sands, not knowing they were Pontins, and said, "Look, I got this idea," and they said, "Well, we're not interested, but I can tell our head office see if they're interested." Five minutes later, the phone rang, and this girl said, "Well, yeah, I'm from Pontins head office. Yeah, I understand you want to do this weekend." And I said, "Yeah," and she said, "Well, we got this place in Hemsby that would be perfect," and I said. If you'd asked me where's the best location, I would have said, that's it. So within a few days, I was going up to <laughs> Hemsby to have a meeting. And I was actually backed by a place called the Town and Country Club from London because I didn't have the money or the name mm -hmm. to really get a place like that. But the Town and Country Club, being one of the top music venues in the country, they had the reputation and went in there. And I said, look, I've got this theory. The reason the weekenders get so much damage is because people have to go back to their chalets. So all you need to do, keep the music going all night, then people will only go back to their chalets for two things, sleep or a bit of the other, right? Otherwise, they're going to stay and party <laughs> in the ballrooms. And they said, well, it seems to make sense. Yeah. We'll give it a try. And so we organized it all. And I said, look, this is what happened with the last place. And they said, don't worry. There's absolutely no way that guy's going to be able to stop you. So I organized it all. And okay. I booked all the bands and the DJs without telling anyone where it was. Because I didn't want the word to get out. <laughs> so I said, you've got to trust me. Location's easy and stuff like that. And then do you remember, I don't know if you ever saw it, there used to be a little magazine called Where to Rock and Roll in London. It, yeah, all it was long, a yeah. list of all the yeah. clubs yeah. and it was given out all over the country yeah. and i paid for an extra thousand of them to be printed with my flyer as the four center pages um, we okay. set off to a weekender in weymouth and went out giving out all these where to rock and rolls which no one was going to stop in any venue because everyone was advertised in it and i remember giving yeah. it to the guy who organized the Weymouth Weekender and his face as he opened it and saw the center pages. He was really <laughs> upset. Well, he told me to go and organize the Weekender, so I did. <laughs> uh, okay. And Andy, how, how did it start for you, the the, the um, Waldorf Weekender? When, um, when was the first one? I forgot. The first one was in the year 2000, <laughs> but oh. uh, the history of me organizing festivals started in uh, 19... 86 with the first two band show uh 87 with the first festival with four bands like the crystal airs leonard rockers down homers and runaway boys that was in a town hall of the uh, city i was living at that time where i was growing up mm -hmm. and uh, the first big festival actually was in munich in 1993 where Tom, you actually DJed there. Yes, then. I remember that. So it must have, you know. <laughs> it rained and there was a puddle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, was, it was on Facebook a few days ago, like memories of Rose Maddox, Glenn Glenn, and the Hillbilly yeah, Boogie yeah. Man and everything. And that was prior Tom emigrating to the US. You were still yeah. in yeah. Europe back then. Yeah. And I had uh, Strolling Steve and Lee, uh, Lee Hagman uh, Lee from yeah. the UK. And uh, yeah, Glenn Glenn, Gary Lambert, Rose Maddox, Hillbilly Boogie, Boogeyman, Crazy Cabin. That was my first ever big festival. 
mm -hmm. from there, other festivals followed in different locations. What, Not in the UK. The Panzer Hall. Yeah, yeah, the Panzer, the Tank Hall, basically yes. the Panzer Hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, from there, um, other than England with the holiday camps, we in Germany had to use clubs or town halls to host events, which is quite different because people have to sleep in hotels five miles away, mm. 10 miles away, or in the car, which is inconvenient. Yeah. This is in why <laughs> everybody went to the English weekenders, because you could go to a, into a holiday camp, crash it and go back home. <laughs> mm. yeah. And my actually the Waldorf Rock and Roll weekender, honestly, was my open house for the 10th anniversary of my company Rock and Roll in Products. So I invited business partners, I invited friends, and I made a big party in the location where I had my own shop. I rented the whole place, which is like a small was like a small shopping mall. And when all the shops were closing, I opened the doors for the rockabillies. Interesting concept. I... <laughs> <laughs> but that was the first rock and roll weekender. Um, let me check. 9th to 11th of June, year 2000, with 20 bands. You're prepared, and I like that. there, everything <laughs> wrote. That was the 10th anniversary of my, of my company. So this yeah. was why it started. Yeah. So uh, guys, I encourage you in, in the crowd to, to ask some questions. I'm, I'm sure you have some questions. Ah, here, Dylan, he has a question for Tom. As you have had many original U.S. rockabilly artists at Hamsby in the early days and Viva, who has been your favorite to work with? I just put it on the screen as well. Thank you, Dylan, for the for the question. That's a hard one. It is. Out of the rock, <laughs> out of the strictly rockabilly acts, my favorite to work with. That is really tough because <laughs> so many of them have been so good to work with. You know, mm. obviously Sonny Burgess and always sort of springs to mind. Um, Curtis Gordon, Lou Williams, became really good friends with Lou Williams. Um, I think to pick one, though, would be unfair because yeah. so many of them have been great for so many years. Um Out of the other, the, no, the sort of non-rockabilly American acts, um, Herb Cox of the Cleftones became good friends with him and his wife, and he helped me book a lot of acts. So he was always great. Dewey Terry was great. Um, mm -hmm. Who else? And a lot of people will be shocked about this. One of the people who was the easiest to deal with was Chuck Berry. <laughs> he was great. And, uh, yeah. and do you know why? And I will defend Chuck Berry because of this. Did you, ha did you have him more often than, uh, like, was it 2014 no. or, or something? Could I be right? Wrong? I only had Chuck Berry once and it was number 13, which was, I suppose, 10 years ago. It was after Jerry Lee, yeah? Or I think no, Jerry Lee was... Chuck Berry was before? the first of the okay. big original acts. And what it is, on his contract, it's got certain things. One of them be, yeah. is yeah. he has to have a certain guitar amp and it has to be a certain year. And it says, okay. if you do not have that guitar amp on the stage, you have to give him $2,000 cash to walk on the stage. <laughs> right? It's there. It's in the contract, and people sign yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah. not only did I make sure that we had that amp, but we got two of them in case the first one had problems. Yeah. yeah. And so, and but what that does, if he turns up and it's the wrong amp and he has to ask for the cash, that puts him in a bad mood, and so yeah. everything goes downhill from there. With us, he was so happy to see the two of them. He loved the band, especially Carl Sonny Lay Leyland playing piano with him. He was mm -hmm. smiling yeah, at Carl because he was yeah, enjoying yeah, it yeah. so much. And the result was, even though there weren't supposed to be any cameras, he was playing to the cameras that the audience were holding up. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I always remember that. 
Um, hard to imagine. I'm just I'm sorry. I, I think it's hard to imagine now uh, that there was a time when the people actually the security checked if like if you had a camera if you were filming <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they were gonna get you i mean now it's just <laughs> impossible we've, yeah. <laughs> we've only had one band that has really been over the top strict anti-cameras okay. so much so their manager would go around trying to stop people from filming in the audience because okay. i said yeah. i actually added on the contract our security will not stop people with cameras yeah. Yeah. and and everyone knows that band. <laughs> How about you, Andy? Uh, any 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 favorite uh, original artist to work with, or any uh, rock and roll artist? Um, it's Hard it's one. similar to what Tom said. Actually, working with those guys, you recognize they are all grateful, humble, down to earth people who do not ask for much. If they are from the fifties and they were still around or are still around. Um, you have to, uh, you just have to treat them like human beings and they do not demand any extra service. They are just really, they were always really, really nice to work with. And, um, obviously I, I didn't, um, I, I toured in the nineties a lot with Glenn Glenn and Curtis Gordon and Rose Maddox and uh, Hayden Thompson as well. And with all those, and Marvin Rainwater, and with all those where we spent two weeks on the road, three weeks on the road, me being the driver or me, me letting the other guy drive <laughs> in Germany on the motorway, <laughs> yeah. um, we always got, uh, we always had a great time. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing super complicated. And I'm very grateful for these days and these experiences because that taught, taught me personally a lot about how, how musicians and artists value themselves. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And say, Blondie. well... Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I work with some of the old uh, guys, you know, the original artists, and um, it was always great. I mean, it was amazing you know uh, i backed some of them up and you know i played at, at viva with uh, janice martin and also played with glenn glenn at the bear family uh, festival and uh, yeah yeah it was <laughs> fantastic times and some of the highlights definitely and okay andy let's get to some music i uh, can you introduce us to your top three rock and roll songs um, and, and tell us a little s story to e each one of them um, my top three. Now I have to re remember which three <laughs> songs I've should, should I tell you? <laughs> um, let I'm me guess. trying to remember mine. <laughs> let, let me guess. I, I know it was um, Matchbox Rockabilly Rebel, simply as um, it was one of the two first uh, records I ever got. And the German version of Ted Herold caught me, yeah. and I still have this record. And it, I, I remember going out, well, it is our theme, no more, yeah. no less. It's, uh, and we can shout it out loud. Um, they, um, actually, I have six most favorite songs. Did I put uh, <laughs> What's Your Name, Stray Cat Strut, um, um, Tell Me, James Infeld? Well, well you got one. one, yeah, you got one so far, right? So, Rockabilly <laughs> Rebel was right, <laughs> and um, and the pretty world uh, yeah. today, James Infeld. That's another one, yeah. And, that, but uh, I, I wanted, I wanted to just stop you for for a second because I prepared Rockabilly Rebel uh, <laughs> for you because um, I didn't hear but when I grew up. Uh, I was born in '74. I, I I don't remember Rockabilly Rebel, but I remember Midnight Dynamo, the the German version, which is uh, called Volldampf Radio and uh, <laughs> Leinemann. <laughs> Leinemann, that's the band. Uh, full Steam Radio or something like that. Uh, and I also remember Ted Harrell's song uh, Ja das war Bill Haley, mm -hmm. and and I really liked that one. So. I have a little connection to, to Matchbox and uh, 
Yeah, so I prepared uh, Rockabilly Rebel. So let's see if we can get it on screen. And I hope you like my version. <laughs> let's uh, do it. Let me start the right video. Take the question off here. Yeah, we don't see the wrong video. <laughs> <laughs> here from the solo mode yeah well done uh, <laughs> I, tried, I tried my <laughs> i tried my best uh yeah um i do everything for clicks and People likes all over the world right now. <laughs> <laughs> i got i got one here <laughs> i just didn't want to do it for myself <laughs> Yeah, and uh, somebody wrote uh, uh, die schönen 80er, uh, the cool 80s. Uh, well, that, w that was all from the early 90s. And yes, I was wearing this jacket 24-7. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, yeah, I, I had a big, um, good fun with it. And um, Heiko, I, ho I hope it was okay for you. <laughs> Singer of the fo uh, Foggy Mountain Rockers. <laughs> Okay, so that was, um, I thought, I hoped it would be number one, but now it was number three, I did it anyway. And uh, what was uh, your number two? I think you mentioned already, uh, yeah, James Infeld. James Infeld, Pretty World. Um, I'm, um, well, people know I'm a James Infeld fan, as many others. And uh, on one of our uh, trips through the USA, we only had one CD. So <laughs> on the drive from Los Angeles to Las Vegas through through the desert, uh, there was pretty world all around, all around. And actually, um, this song always puts me in a very good mood. No matter what day it is, what happened before, I always have a smile on my face hearing that song. It just makes me makes me uh, feeling good. Yeah, I agree. I, I like the song too. And I think, uh, especially live, um, it, James does a great job. Like, uh, it's one of, I think it's probably my favorite version of the song when he does it live. So do you remember your number one, yeah. Andy? Yeah, <laughs> Johnny Cash, Personal <laughs> Jesus. It's, um, um, 
Number one for the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Number two for the the transformation of a modern pop song of the 90s into a rockabilly version being an indi uh, an independent song by by Johnny Cash. So it is not written by a rock and roll artist, but it is converted by an artist into a song which really catches me and is outstanding individually from the original version. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, and it, Johnny Cash introduced it to the scene, and then all of a sudden, uh, many bands played it, covered it as well. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if it would be only a Dep uh, Depeche Mode song, you know, if they only sang it, I think the chances that Rockabilly Band would, would cover it uh, would be very small. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah. So we have a super chat, our first super chat today from uh, Stephanie. <laughs> I know her. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, question to both. Can you remember a funny situation with a musician from the 50s at your festival? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Dewey Terry, as in Don Dewey. Terry. Dewey. Yeah. Okay, so it was just before he was supposed to go on stage. He's backstage and he said, my cape, I've forgotten my cape. I need my <laughs> cape. I can't go on stage without my cape. And so we got one of the security to run to his room to get the cape. And the security guy ran back with a cape. Dewey's put it on. He's walked out on stage and thrown it off. <laughs> <laughs> he only had to have it to walk from the dressing room onto the stage and that was it. Oh, wow. And I do have one other as well from Ruth right. Brown. She oh. um, hadn't performed for quite a few years, and she kept saying to me before she went on stage, she goes, if they throw tomatoes at me, I'm going to blame you. It's going to be your fault. And I said, no, just do these songs I told you. She goes, are you sure? I don't think they're going to like all those songs. And I said, they're going to love the songs. She goes, well, if they throw those tomatoes, I'm going to blame you. <laughs> <laughs> And needless to say, they didn't throw any oh, they, tomatoes. They loved it. <laughs> when I was uh, when I was uh, um, on the road with Hayden Thompson, he was recognizing that I was going to fall asleep while driving. So he told me, "Well, <laughs> son, I'm a professional driver. I know how to drive. Let me drive." So we switched <laughs> seats. I I fell asleep on on the on the other seat and uh, Hayden was driving. And when I was, I was, I was, um, I woke up because all the trucks passing us were honking their horns. <laughs> <laughs> so he was going like 80 kilometers on the freeway in Germany, which is like 60 miles <laughs> per hour ish, 55, 60, which 55, is uh, yeah, yeah. okay, average for an American. Every single truck <laughs> overturned us and was honking. <laughs> oh, it wasn't great a festival, stories. but I just remember that situation. I thought you were going to say you woke up and you were in the wrong country or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was with borders. That was back in the day where we had, when we had real borders. Ah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing. The, and of course, uh, uh, the stories and the, thank you for the question. It was a great question. Yeah, that's always yes. interesting f for me as well. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I also so thank you very much for the super chat. And you can also uh, ask questions, please do. Um, um, don't be shy. <laughs> the guys are waiting. So this was a very special year 2020 uh, still going on uh i mean you both had to cancel your your weekenders uh let's talk a little bit about that what i mean what's in the in, in the future what what do you have any plans for uh, view las vegas 2020 and the uh, waldorf weekend uh, uh, not two, two, 2021 let's say 21 <laughs> this year <laughs> and the same uh, question to andy um do you have any plans for this year for the weekend 
Should I go first? Or yeah, you, you go first. Yeah, let's, let's change okay. it up. <laughs> um, well, we're still... Uh, we have not lost all hopes, but uh, it looks like there is not going to be a Wild Dog Rock and Roll win Weekender as we want it to be. And uh, because of that, we will make a three-day streaming Weekender with online concerts interviews, stories, movie clips, video clips, and everything. And if we have the chance to um, permit people in, then we, th we will think about having a reduced capacity of uh, people in the Astoria Hall. But this is today unpredictable. You can't, you can't plan it and you can't promote it and you can't guarantee anything. So for this year, Unfortunately, we have to focus on the online Waldorf Weekender. Tom? <sighs> it's a difficult <laughs> question. Obviously, we've cancelled two now. So <clears throat> um, we cancelled April last year and April this year. And we've got one organised for September this year. And mm. we're hoping that enough people have been vaccinated for us to have some sort of event. But as this year's progressing, things are looking a little bit tougher, probably more so from Europe, because Europe seems to be behind the USA on vaccinations. And yeah. so we don't know how many people are going to be able to make it from Europe, or even if people are going to be able to travel without doing two weeks quarantine. So we're still hoping to go ahead with um, September, but we're going to make it probably more geared towards Americans so we'll have mainly American bands because I don't want to book a load of bands from Europe and then like half the bands can't come to the event or something like that so I'm yeah. going to go mainly with American acts and we're going to do it at 50% capacity because we might not be at 100% capacity by then so yeah. I think 50% is a pretty good number to go with and we're spreading everything out a bit so we expect there's going to be a space between each vendor they might want mm -hmm. sort of 10 feet or three meters between each vendor and stuff like mm -hmm. that so we've got a new layout for the upstairs which we think will work and we're gonna see how it goes um i think it'll be a good event and the people who remember the smaller ones of years gone by i think are going to be very very happy but <laughs> It's, you know, we, we can still have some original acts because obviously they're in the USA. Yeah. Um, so we're looking forward to it, and, but it all comes down to what the regulations are going to be. And Vegas is already at 35% capacity, but they're not opening okay. any music venues or, or nightclubs yet. So, okay. but they also reckon that by July, everyone will be able to get vaccinated. It's just a case of going in and getting it. So yeah. I think we're going to be okay on the on the American audience, but it's the rest of the world I don't know. And the British will be okay by then because they seem to be very advanced on vaccinations. Mm. And also anyone from Israel. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we do have two regulars from Israel. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, yeah, I wish... Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So that's what our plans are, and... Yeah, we're starting. We started doing our lists of who we want to book, but it's I not, guess yeah, perhaps it's not what we normally would do. But it's still going. We're going to make sure it's a really good event, though. Yeah. I guess we all have to try to survive this year by doing something, something which is possible to organize yeah. and to let happen. But all in all. Tom, you and I and everybody else just would wants to go back to normal as it was yeah. before. Everything else is just a uh, drop of water on a hot stone, just trying to survive, not get, uh, not getting forgotten, just um, awareness. Well, we all try to reach our customers, say that we're still alive, we're still there, we're still trying to continue. But uh, this year we will not be able 
we will be far away from being able to break even with anything we do. Yeah. It, I see what we do in September is just that communication to everyone. We're still here. We're going ahead, ready for the next one in April next year. Yeah, I wish both of you, I mean, all the luck, of course, you know, um, and that, I mean, Andy, we, we work together and I, I hope we, we can organize good uh, online weekend, or I'm sure we can. <laughs> and um, yeah, Tom, of course, uh, I hope you can at least get something going yeah. and uh, it, it looks okay. Yeah, let's keep our fingers crossed as uh, Betty Sue just said, yeah. All right, so we had, I think, one other question. Oh, yeah, don't forget about Udo. Udo had a question. Um, and then we have the Young and Wild segment of the show. Tom, why, uh, uh, Tom, why is he moved to the USA? And did he closely stat the Viva Las Vegas? I moved to the USA because I met a girl who's now my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then when we got divorced, I decided to stay here. And so that's how I ended up here. The funny thing is, I sort of knew a long time before that I was interested in moving to Southern California and it just all came together. But did he closely start the VLV? Um, is, it, is, it, is it start? Uh, probably, yeah, that's start. Udo. <laughs> Spell checker. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> yeah. I start. Yeah. I started organising it as soon as I got to the USA. In fact, originally I was looking at doing one in Southern California, okay. but then I realised that the licensing laws in Southern California weren't going to be any good for a weekender. You know, and I was a friend. Some friends were having to get together and. Then I heard these two people talking about Las Vegas and how they'd just been there and they were drinking all night. And I said, oh, can you drink all night in Vegas? They said, yeah. I said, oh. <laughs> and then a few minutes went by and I was sitting there thinking about it. And then all of a sudden I just shouted out, Las Vegas. And everyone looked at me and they said, what? I said, that's where I need to do a weekender. Okay. And another, so great, I, another great story. <laughs> I said about trying to get a place i looked at a number of hotels and wasn't having a lot of luck and then i was i just happened to be on the phone with the then manager of the trenniers a guy called seymour heller <laughs> and we were just chatting and i knew that he was obviously he was the trenniers manager he's also liberace's manager okay. but what i didn't know he was a big movie producer and even to this day the Producers Guild Awards still have the Seymour Heller Award. Mm -hmm. So but I didn't know all this. And anyway, I said to him, yeah, I'm trying to do a weekend in Vegas, but I can't find a hotel. And it wasn't asking him for help or anything. It was just general chat. And he said, oh, a friend of mine, he's in charge of entertainment at the Gold Coast. And that was it. So yes. we we got the Gold Coast because of the Trenier's manager. Great. And I, I went there. I was there the first in 98. I, it was my first time to the US and uh, first time in Vegas. And yeah, it was just mind blowing. <laughs> the whole thing. I mean, yeah, the whole trip to the US and then Las Vegas and then the festival. It was just, uh, yeah, unforgettable. And um, okay, let's start the, the next, uh, the next segment of the show here. I just have to get back in solo layout. And hopefully, I press the right buttons. Okay. <laughs> okay, who is this? Uh, question to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> is this me? <laughs> is it Tom or is it Andy? <laughs> uh, th there's a 10 second delay between us uh, talking and uh, before the audience can can hear me can hear us. So um, yeah, just uh, give them some time <laughs> and then re reveal the secret. Okay, Dylan says Andy. 
Elliot said, uh, says Andy. Let's have one more. <laughs> Somebody going with Randy? <laughs> Probably not. Okay, so who is it? Who of you? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're all wrong. Dylan, Elliot, Axel, Georgia, you're all wrong. <laughs> you, 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 you must have looked like, like Andy when you were a kid. <laughs> well, <that's scary. laughs> uh, there's nothing on there to actually give away which country it is in is there yeah uh, no that's a hard one uh, i mean the the, the by uh, or the tr is it, it's a trike yeah it's yes. not a it's not a, a like a with a wheel on the wrong side or <laughs> 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 it, it could be it could have been in germany the picture is the, basically the same yeah yeah the house is not uh it, it, yeah it could be any, anywhere yeah really so uh, how old were you then tom i don't know i suppose i must have been about three <laughs> something like that i can't remember okay <laughs> <laughs> what's that uh where you lived or yes that was our back garden That okay. would have been in, I think that would have been a place called Lee, was it Lee Park? It's either Lee Park or Emsworth. Oh, right. <laughs> Where in England is that? Like, On the south coast near Portsmouth. South coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So who's that? <laughs> That's easier. <laughs> it's Andy again. Yeah. So... Um, Andy, where was that shot taken? Do you remember? That was on a show of the Cat Cats in Munich in a club there. I was too young to drive, so a friend of mine had to drive us to Munich and back through the night, like four hours drive, because we had a dance class Sunday morning, 10 a.m. Yeehaw! Oh. <laughs> you got the same hair, haircut as I had back then. <laughs> <laughs> And Axel, actually, Axel from the the Cat Cats, he was uh, he was watching earlier, so maybe he's still there. So, say uh, hi to to Augsburg, Axel. Still, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, like in the early, like in the '90s, a lot of people um, thought I was you. They 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 talked to me and said, "Ah, oh, hey, I bought this record from you." I said, "Well, no." <laughs> And then they, they realized um, it's not, you know, I'm yeah. not Andy Widda, but a lot of people thought I'm Andy Widda. Yeah, I have the <laughs> same experience. We always get, uh, we are brothers, so, so to say. That's <laughs> yeah. uh, another one. All right. <laughs> so this is Tom again. We, we mix it up. When was that? I would have been 17 at the time. Okay. It's a 1959 Matchless G12. Oh, you remember? Is, was that your first bike? Or? That was my first motorbike, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And yeah. Uh, obviously the fashion <laughs> tells us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to think how to comment yeah. on it. But... <laughs> yeah, I was confused between whether I was a teddy boy or a rocker. And Georgia, Georgia asked, uh, "Who's on the T-shirt?" Buddy Holly, like Buddy Holly to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so cool. Yeah, that's a great picture. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Andy, another another great picture with uh, going back with to Las friend. Vegas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I miss I, I miss the garden party. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yeah! Very much. Well, Ron is a close friend for decades now. Ron and Laurie and the sons, we were, my wife Heike and I were the first guests in their uh, guest room when they uh, were living in Las Vegas. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of licensing, re-releasing music of Rolling Rock Records. And in the decades, we just became great friends and we uh, I'm, I'm i'm really grateful to know this guy <laughs> yeah I, I, I mean he's a real rockabilly fanatic yeah uh, yeah crazy yeah 
yeah i lo love uh, ronnie weiser as well and it's it's always great to go out for dinner or for for lunch and sh share information and hear stories and well i i guess that what um what's very important for everyone hear stories hear history get in you know there's yeah. so much so much history so much stories so much interesting news and we all die for uh hearing stories what people did and where what happened and ronnie is a is a fountain of information oh so was seymour by the way tom yes. Seymour Heller was one of those guys as well who was full of stories all the time yeah and, I mean, uh, I, not many people Hogan. know that the trend is were actually mm. in more rock and roll movies than any other band. Oh, yeah. no, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Jorge, uh, he says that rock and Ronnie changed my life. And uh, yeah, I think he did so much for, for Rockabilly and uh, um, with all the bands he produced. And yeah, really thankful to, for everything he did, definitely. And his garden parties. All right, here's another one from Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, is it you, Andy? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Andy's here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we were Was all it? thin back. We are still thin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. Is that I, taken? Is that taken later than the other one with on, on the motorbike? Or is that before? Actually, slightly earlier. On this okay. one, I would have been about fifteen or sixteen. <clears throat> And that was taken in our back garden in Beckenham in Kent. Okay, cool. So you, back then, you were sure about the Teddy Boy style. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thin. It's a great picture. Eh? And we have another one from, from Andy, the last one. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's Matt that's Boovery on the left. And Max, uh, Max wife back in the day. Um, yeah, well, on a show on the next morning after breakfast, Mac Bouvry of Mac Records in Belgium. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. Uh, a wonderful guy, a great guy. And uh, I was on tour with obviously Glenn Glenn in these days. That must have been like. 94 ish the wild bob burgess record came out i guess in 93 or 94 so having that t-shirt on <laughs> I, I guess it's 93 of 94. wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's that's another great great picture so thank you so much for for sending me those those pics and uh i really enjoyed those and uh, i think the audience as well so let's see, did I skip a question here? Uh, let's get back to me. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Dylan has another question. Uh, to both of you, once everything returns to normal, do you guys think live music will make a huge return or will be more, and will be more appreciated than it was before? Who's first? I'll go first if you want. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think we've we you with any scene, ours included. Naturally, in normal times, you lose people off the scene for various reasons: uh, new girlfriend, new boyfriend, just get bored of it, get married, have kids, stuff like that. These sort of things are still happening but we've had nothing to bring new people into the scene. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to take that the people who are still within the scene are going to rush out and attend everything they can. I'm sure of that, but I don't know how many people are left. So it might take a little bit longer to recover, but that's going to be the same for all the music scenes. We might find that there's a way of, no, well, there's a whole load of new people who are hearing the music who haven't heard it before that we don't know about and they'll be looking for somewhere to go. And yeah, yeah we, we had that chat the other day about the reaction videos and how, you know, 
there's some with Elvis songs. And so there might be this whole new audience of Elvis looking for somewhere to go and might come out to the events. But I, I, I think it's all up in the air. I don't think anyone knows what's going to happen. Yeah, let, let's hope. <laughs> I'm, do you, unfortunately, do I'm unfortunately a bit skeptic, a bit more skeptic, mm -hmm. because all the guys... All the old guys, all the original guys are gone by now or will not last for another 20 years. So that impact is away. Um, on the other hand, during this pandemic, there is so much free content on the Internet with free live shows, free concerts. You can spend years years to watch everything which is online and i'm part of it i i'm just saying it's much more convenient to stay at home eat drink save money save gas and watch something online i would hate it but i think it has an impact on the number of people who will come back to shows pay entrance and support live music plus there is so much choice for young people in these days that one of the reasons why we don't have so many young young people joining us is choices multimedia choices digital choice choices other things beside music um, so i hope that live music will have a huge return because people who are not able to go out now hopefully will want to go out twice as much once it's possible again and especially support unknown or um, young bands again. Yeah, I think um, for me, I think there will be a spark after you know, after, it's like, I think it's, no, I don't know, it's not the same, but when I was, you know, I was brought up in East Germany and all of a sudden when the wall came down and everybody could go out and new clubs opened up and everybody just wanted to party and uh, there was oh. just a great atmosphere. And I hope something similar, you know, will come that people just, you know, or like after the prohibition. Or <laughs> I think what you know, will help. Yeah. I think that modern music has hit a wall and I mm -hmm. hear it with my daughters. Yeah, you know, one especially was heavily into hip hop mm -hmm. and and I noticed she hit a wall with it. And so now they're going back in time and looking for old music. And, you know, both of my daughters here are buying records, not downloading digital and yeah. They haven't got into our music yet, but the time is going to come. But the fact that the kids are actually looking at other types of music could be something that will help give us a boost. Mm. We have to make offers so that young yeah. people can take the offer and experience music. We need a band to get in the charts. Yeah, that yeah. Would be or at least have commercial success. So and that, um, and that band has to be yeah. young. Yes. Um, so I have two questions from uh, Doc Horn. I think it's two of them. <laughs> um, because one says Doc Horn and the Hornabees, and the other one says Doc Ron Horn. So I, I guess it's the same guy. But <laughs> um, Andy, can Ben send you a message as well when they like I to? I already replied. Yes. Take part in your stream, <laughs> but just for, for, for everybody. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, because we have uh, people on YouTube and Facebook, and uh, I'm not sure if they can see. Oh, okay, so please, uh, yes, yeah, send Andy a message, and he will get uh, get back as soon as possible. And then he also yeah. asks, uh, what is needed to attract youngsters to the rock and roll scene? And I think we just answered yeah. that. And I see it, like, I teach guitar, and um, I now have, like, uh, two girls, they're like, uh, not my own guitar uh, mm -hmm. students, they're like 14 years old, I think, 15, 15. Wow. And um, 
they're influenced by like what's on Netflix, and then then you have you know some Netflix series which takes part in, in the fifties, nineteen fifties or nineteen sixties, and then they get introduced to the music and then they yeah. they like it and then uh, they want to play some of that. So that this is great for me. And then <laughs> uh, the other day there's like oh I would like to learn uh, Pretty Woman by Raw Business. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I guess the answer to the question, what is needed to attract youngsters to the rock and roll scene is to make the rock and roll scene attractive to young people. Yes, and, and that's needed not only with a, a band in the charts or commercial success, but think back to what we used to have on TV, things like Happy Days and movies like American Graffiti. It was always out there. And so there's yeah. always something to get us interested. And I think a very good example is Walk the Line. I mean, I, I played Johnny Cash songs with my band, like from, I don't know, 96, 97, 98. And people liked it. It was okay. But after Walk the Line, I mean, people just <laughs> went crazy for Johnny yeah. Cash. And I mean, yeah. what, what used to be the, the, the stray cat, the, the cat, you know, on the arm as a tattoo became Johnny Cash. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you know, I'll tell you something about that film. In the scene with Johnny Cash and June Carter on the stage performing. Yeah. The guitar amp and, and speaker on the stage. Mm -hmm. I, I own it. <laughs> okay. I own that guitar amp that's used in so the you're, film. So you're part of the movie, <laughs> technically. <laughs> I didn't own it then, but I do now. Ah, and you I've do got now. the measure okay. of authenticity and everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Cool. And Just uh, we, were for you. we were talking about charts. So, uh, Tom, your charts, <laughs> your top three. Uh, rock I and have the songs. same problem as Andy. I know it's definitely slow down, Larry Williams. I've got love if you want it, Warren Smith. And I remember I was debating on the third one. <laughs> and it's either going to be. <laughs> it's either the train kept rolling, Johnny Burnett. Was it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> lights out, Jerry Byrne, and it could have been Jailhouse Rock Elvis. Okay, and um, which one did I pick to to perform? I don't know. Uh, out, out of uh, well, have a guess. <laughs> Get love if you want it by Warren Smith. Slow down, Larry Williams, or the train kept rolling by Johnny Burnett. I think you probably went with I've got love if you want it. Yeah, that's kind of home court, uh, home court for me because <laughs> the Sun and Lightning show. I, I love Sun Records, and I yeah. know you do too, and Andy probably yeah. as well. It's just uh, it's, it's nothing like it. So um, yes, I, I tried myself. I tried to do this one. So here it is. <laughs> I hope I do it. I got love if you want it. I got love if you want it I got love if you want it Got your love if you want it I got love if you want it We can rock a while We can rock a while Quit teasing me, baby Quit teasing me, baby You're fine looking thing You're fine looking thing If you let me love you I'll be your loving man I'll be your loving man I'm a king bee, baby I'm a king bee, baby Buzzing around your high Buzzing around your high I can make the money and let me come inside and let me come inside I know you've been bought it, 
want it. I got your love if you want it. I got your love if you want it. Got your love if you want it. I got your love if you want it. Oh, we can rock a while. Oh, we can rock a while. All right. <laughs> So that was, uh, yeah, I got love if you want. I didn't do the drums and the bass. That was uh, done by the guys from Berlin. But I, right. I did the rest. <laughs> we'll <laughs> give you part. another round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have to ask, was it a little uh, out of sync? Yes, you look like you're in a Bruce Lee movie. Yes, uh, that was my plan. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It has to do with the streaming. I have to be uh, <laughs> have to come up with something else next time. I'm I'm sorry about that, but uh, I, I promise it was in sync when I <laughs> on, on the original video. <laughs> you got to trust me on that one. All right, yeah, great, and um, yeah, love uh, Warren Smith. Have you have you ever worked with Warren Smith? I mean, he died pretty early but i know he played in england tom i know i never saw him no i, no, I, never I was him. supposed to go to a show and for some reason i didn't go and that was it the only opportunity a question to you andy was there a 50s guy that you would have loved to see but you didn't go because of uh like any reason and then later you, you regret it and you, you didn't they, there was no chance anymore to see him well if you ca if you try to catch as many of the original artists as you can then you always fail so <laughs> um yeah of course but i wouldn't i wouldn't name anyone in particular i was just uh, going for chances and then try to see well it, it was like uh when i was in um, in the uh, palomino palomino in north hollywood in 1990 two or three, Ray Campy came in and said, uh, Fred Maddox just died. And mm. that was the last chance to eventually see him. So I, uh, at this moment, I said like, okay, one chance less to see one of the original guys. But um, in the end, you attend weekenders and you attend festivals to see those guys appearing alive and you try to catch as many as you can simple as that and and for me from for me personally i was busy with doing this and just try to suck in uh, as much as i can yeah I, i actually i never got to see johnny cash even though he played often in in, in germany uh yeah. in the 90s um and fats domino the same and i i mean money was limited back then uh, was uh, still pretty young when they were touring I saw Jerry Lee many, many times. And actually, I think I'm one of the lucky guys. Like every time I went to see Jerry Lee, he actually appeared played. and played. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Because I, I know people who went like five times to see Jerry Lee and he, he was never there. So <laughs> He's always played when I've gone to see him as well. All right. And I, yeah, I saw him in... In Vegas, that was a great show, actually, in 2012, when yeah. you played at the car, car mm. show. So I'm the guy with the bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Jerry Lee, obviously, is still around, and um, th that's a big surprise as well. <laughs> so um, I, I, if I go back to like my top three, I'll pro probably pick... Um, Baby Let's Playhouse, Elvis, a whole lot of shaking going on, and Tennessee by, by your cup, Perkins. So it's all, all sun stuff. <laughs> yeah. See, that, I've you... also got songs that had big influences on me. And for example, yeah. I remember the day I was about 16 and I got the Johnny Burnett LP that had just been reissued in the UK. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a life changing moment listening to that LP. Yeah. 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 It really I, was. I, I can definitely see that. So guys, do you have uh, in the crowd, do you have any more uh, questions? Just let us know. Um, Ruby Ann's watching us at the moment. She just sent me a message. Great. I haven't seen her in a long time. Is she still in Portugal? I guess so, huh? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And one of our DJs on the radio as well. Okay. So, um, 
you can you can uh, think of a, of another question, and um, I will get the the quiz game started. Oh, let me see. I'm winning now. Right. <laughs> so always like that jingle. And today I'm actually prepared. So uh, if you answer the questions, um, the one question that I have, right, you get one of those: the Sun and Lightning EP, Ike and the Capers, forty-five, or Glen Honeycutt uh, CD. You can you can pick. I'm gonna. I'll add something to the prize as well. Do you know what it's going to be? Yes. A high roller ticket to Viva Las Vegas. That's a good and one. And it can be for it doesn't have to be for the one coming up or the one after. It could be used anytime. Okay. Andy, you, you got one yeah. too? I I've I thought about uh something maybe useful. So I'm uh, throwing in a calendar of uh this year with uh pictures shot on our festival i see deke there yeah yep then i said i, I made i make a few things a bar towel wait wow. this way <laughs> and depending and this wow. for so needed on weekenders and yeah. i throw in the Bits and pieces, uh, some bits and pieces more. <laughs> so there's lots of stuff to win, and uh, this is why the qu the question is also a bit more complicated today. Um, the first one who can name all six, or let's say at least five, of Andy's and Tom's uh, top six, <laughs> like top three, <laughs> yeah, will win all of this. What we just presented, so. The top three of Andy, uh, no particular order, and the top three of uh, Tom. You don't have to name the songs I mentioned. <laughs> and uh, remember, it's always a 10 second delay, so we have to, to wait a little bit until the first answers uh, are coming up. But Tom, I was actually surprised to see that you're on the, the International Movie Database. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um, okay, Elliot says, "Got love if you want it." So th this is one, but we need five. Oh, okay, can you? You don't have to use five comments, Elliot. Oh, okay, <laughs> but you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. Okay. Got love you want to train Capron, slow down. This is good. Warren Smith, got love you want to matchbox, Rockabilly Rebel, Johnny Burnett, train Capron. This is four. Dylan, slow down is five. Heiko, Rockabilly Rebel, Stray Cat Strut is wrong. James Infeld, that's not a song. Sorry. <laughs> lights out. Oh, uh, lights out is wrong. It was in the discussion, but it was not in the top three. Udo, uh, Rockabilly Rebel, C Cash. Rock Billy Rebel James Infeld. Okay. Axel, got love if you want it. Warren Smith, train kept rolling. Slow down. Rock Billy Rebel. Pretty world. Is that five? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Axel. <laughs> Axel is the winner. <laughs> Very good. Axel from from Belgium, yeah. So, Axel, you would you will get all of this. So, uh, Andy and I we will we're happy that you won because uh, the the shipping will be cheap for us. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll be fast <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and fast. <laughs> for me, it's just an email. I'll need his email address. <laughs> yeah, we I I get your <laughs> smart oh, yeah. choice. <laughs> very good, very good. Yeah. Well, at the so, moment. Yes. So, <laughs> the battle between the USA and Europe is sort of non-existent. <laughs> yeah. So congratulations, Axel. Nice job, as uh, CC uh, said. Uh, thank you, CC, again for uh, Corey for your job as a moderator. 
And now is your last chance to ask any question you want to ask uh, Tom or Andy, and also your last chance um, to donate something to Let's Talk at Rocket. Uh, let's what is it? Let's Talk at RandyRich.de, or uh, you can also send a super chat if you would like to support the show and uh, help it grow. <laughs> Dylan says so close. Yeah, you were you were actually very close. <laughs> well, maybe next time. So, um, um, Andy, do you want to say something to 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 the to the viewers yeah. to everybody? Yeah. And by the way, I just want to mention you can also, if you didn't catch uh, the live stream, you can watch it on YouTube and I think on Facebook as well on the page. Uh, Let's talk rock and roll. I will have it there. Yeah. I would, okay. sorry, I would first of all invite everybody to join our free Waldorf Rock and Roll Weekend uh, online streaming on uh, May 21 to 24 um, on our Facebook, on our YouTube, on our Patreon channel. Um, secondly, I would ask everybody kindly to support Randy's video uh, <laughs> channel and support him to be able to continue what he's doing right now on Patreon and uh, on YouTube as well. Just there is no chance for musicians at the moment to work, to create income. And uh, we as fans Not with live music, yeah. yeah, yeah, we as fans have to support musicians so that musicians are and artists in general are able to continue doing what they want to do with their art. It's not possible without our support. So please support the artists. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that, of course. <laughs> Tom? I would also agree with you that you know, people need to support you because you obviously put a lot of work into this. And so they should go to that PayPal address and send you some donations to help you cover all your costs and <laughs> and help you live and buy food and things like that. So definitely that. Um, and as far as my events are concerned, you know, we're going to keep updating the website. We're going to be adding a COVID page to it probably this oh. week, which is where people go to get the updates on what's going to happen with Viva Las Vegas. Um, and also obviously on the radio shows, We're going to be doing more regular updates on the radio shows on Rockin' 24-7 Radio. So, you know, perhaps people want to listen there as well. And yeah. obviously I'm going to be, my shows, I'll be having updates. I'm sure Ruby Ann's going to be doing the updates as well, <clears throat> as well as some of the other DJs. So, Okay, yeah, so. so we have, yeah, uh, definitely check out uh, Tom's uh, uh, radio channel. And, um, yeah, I think that's a great way of... Uh, promoting our music yeah, yes I really, yeah. really appreciate that yeah because yeah it's free people don't have to pay any money for it and yeah. so they just tune into it and we've got it on so many different formats not just on the computer but on internet radios on alexa on loads of other sort of streaming um locations and we've got our apps for android and iphones yeah so another oh yeah Another question from uh, Doc Ron Horn. Any new artists you would recommend to check out? Andy, you want to go first? It's, uh, yeah, I go first. <laughs> yeah. Um, at this moment, it's very hard to, to do anything because you cannot check out new artists. I personally like to see a band and if the band catches me, I'm a fan. I like the music. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I, I, I need to see it. It doesn't. It, it's not enough just to hear it or to watch it on Facebook or on YouTube. And since over a year, we are not, or since around a year, we are not able to see any bands live on stage. So for this reason, I cannot really recommend anybody. We need to go back to normal. To have that feeling, to have that atmosphere. Sorry, Tom. I'm. Yeah, I need to see a band as well, and a lot of the bands or acts that are sending me stuff at the moment. 
it's some of them are solo some of them have put it together and it's not the same as seeing a video of a band that's actually playing in a venue with an audience and when, when i do get something from a band i normally know within the te first 10 or 15 seconds whether i'm going to book the band you're probably the same aren't you andy it's you yeah. know very quickly so i there's not really anyone i can recommend at the moment because we're not seeing really what the bands can do so it'd be unfair for me to comment on what i have been receiving and but there's a few that i'm going to keep a lookout for when things go back to normal and they're able to do shows and in fact i'll take this moment to say to bands that want to submit for viva a live a video of a live show is the best don't do it as an attachment do a link to youtube or something like that and that's the best thing for me to see and don't some of the common mistakes that bands make is they have an MC doing a long introduction to their band. That's irrelevant. We don't care what MCs say. We just want to see the band playing. And so mm. one song is better than – it is the best thing because then that gives us a chance. And if, and if I get one song from a band and I like it, then I go looking for more information and more videos. So yep. because, yeah, I've decided from that one song it's worth me doing that. Is that the same for you, Andy? I think that's very helpful to to, to talk oh. from the view of the promoter how how you, you, know, you watch young you know or any um, it doesn't have to be a young band any band who submits something. Yeah. Um, as a as a record label as well, you you get uh, material by posts, but you open the envelope and if it doesn't catch you. In the first 10 seconds as tom says that's it it has to be a good picture an interesting short text um for booking bands it has to it it has to be a video where you get a link i am completely with oh, keep it short what tom says is exactly right but also um being a promoter of a weekender um you have Lots of people who give you information or recommend bands to you or musicians. And in uh, the nick of years, you have a closer group of people. When they recommend you bands, you have a closer look. And if like three or four of those guys name the same artist or the same band, then you will really have a closer look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I actually remember the first time I realized that I could choose a band so quickly with the first 10 seconds of a song. Yeah. And it was hymns B number five, something like that. It was one of the early ones. And I got this LP in the mail and I looked at the cover that, well, this looks okay. I put it on and within those first few seconds, I said, I've got to book this band. I have to book this band. Right. And it was the first LP, big Sandy and the fly right trio. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, straight away, I was on the phone saying, oh, I want to book the this blue, band. The blue one, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that was the first, it was actually that Hem first Hemsby they played was their first show outside of California. Was was okay. there something something similar for you, Andy? Like uh, a band you remember when you started booking bands or where you said, well, oh, this is it, I got to have them? Um, For me, it I can't recall a particular band name, but I can recall the emotion I have when I explore a new band, which I didn't know before. And suddenly I, I just hear it and I'm automatically in it. I just mm -hmm. hear, the, hear the first few seconds and it catches me. So yeah. yes, but I cannot name a particular band well, uh, I think I have a few like from from the nineties. Um, I have um, like the Go Getters when I had them the first time. That the Real Gone LP and um, mm. and uh, and also oh yeah, actually High Noon the <laughs> when the the Rock Me Right uh, uh, album uh, on uh, Willie Louis uh, label 
rockabilly records and um so this is also i think one reason i really love high noon still to this day and next show will be actually uh with um, sean young and and sean mancher the next let's talk rock and roll that's on uh, march 28th so we have uh sean young and sean mancher and they also i mean fantastic musicians and also just great guys i mean i really love you know being with them and yeah i guess for for me it's a little bit you you have um like tom you have your musicians you work with all the time on stage yeah. and you trust them and you rely on them and if they recommend you to listen to something you most likely will do it yes and this is this is basically you have the people you trust and who you know you can re rely on their um uh on their expertise on their recommendation and then you will go there you will check it out and usually you are not disappointed yeah this is yeah there's a few people i can think of who are like that for me um yeah shorty pools one of them ruby ann's one of them um trying to think who else Big Sandy's recommended bands to me before. Mm -hmm. So is Ashley. Um, trying to think who else. I don't. Now I've started mentioning names. I've got to make sure I don't forget anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I can just interrupt you and talk off. <laughs> um, oh, Jerry Chatterbox. Yeah, he often okay. sort of recommends bands from Europe for me. He says, oh, yeah, this is a young band. They're really good. and. Mm -hmm. Udo, Udo from Berlin, he mentions uh, the Playboys, yeah, the, the, the Playboys album 21, that, that was also, uh, and also the, the Comeback Judy, uh, yeah, I thought that yeah. was a fantastic and single. The Playboys, Rob Glaze book, is like a long, long time friend of mine, and he's one of the people, when I first started DJing, would recommend songs for me to play, again, same oh, sort of thing, yeah. I had a group of friends who would recommend songs, and Rob would bring records to the club and say, you need to play this one, and I'd play it, and... <laughs> great all right i think let's wrap it up for today um thank you so much for you, you two for coming on uh on, onto the show and being my guest and telling all those great stories and also thank you for the information regarding the the festivals and we're, we're just yeah hope you know for the best and um as i said before um if you didn't catch the live stream, you, you can still watch it later. Or if you just caught, you know, part of it, you can watch it on YouTube and uh, on Facebook as well. So, I'm, thank you for your questions and your your super chats. And yeah, um, we really appreciate it that you tune in. And I hope you like the show. And um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> you wanna... <laughs> well, thank <laughs> so you. Thank you for thanks for inviting us. Enjoyed it. Yeah, good. Yeah. A great con conversation, and especially uh, those times where I just sit at home here. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's nice great to talk to, to someone. Have the chance to talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thanks for the invitation, Randy. Yeah, You're welcome. You, Randy. And uh, hope to see you both uh, in person as soon as possible. Yeah. Yes. Likewise. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye, bye everybody. Bye, bye Tom. Bye, see you soon. <laughs>